Welcome to CNU, the video series that will teach you everything you need to know to provide excellent nutrition care. In this video, I'm going to talk about diarrhea in patients receiving enteral nutrition. By the end of the video, you should be able to understand why diarrhea is problematic for hospitalized patients and identify four common etiologies in patients receiving enteral nutrition. If you find this information useful, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Let's get started. Diarrhea is an abnormally high volume of feces that is loose or liquid. It's sometimes defined by specific parameters like greater than 500 milliliters of stool per day or greater than three bowel movements per day for at least two consecutive days. However, there is no consensus definition at this time, meaning different textbooks, research articles, and clinical guidelines describe it differently. While this makes it a tricky topic to study, it doesn't make it any less problematic for the patients and clinicians who deal with it. Diarrhea can be problematic for a few reasons. First, an excessive loss of fluid can quickly lead to dehydration, electrolyte abnormalities, and acid-base disorders. These can all have devastating consequences if not treated quickly. Second, Diarrhea exposes the skin that surrounds the anus to excessive moisture and feces, which increases the risk of pressure injuries, especially for patients who are bedbound. Third, if a patient is alert, diarrhea can be a significant source of stress and embarrassment and become a barrier to discharge from the hospital. Taken together, diarrhea results in increased length of stay and higher hospital costs. Any combination of these issues can exist whether the patient is eating by mouth, receiving enteral nutrition or parenteral nutrition, or not receiving any nutrition at all. The one thing that makes enteral nutrition unique is that it's the intervention that's most likely to be blamed as the cause of diarrhea. This blame can either come from the patient themselves, or it can come from a member of the interdisciplinary team. When this happens, the tube feeding is often stopped or the rate is slowed down until the diarrhea improves or the formula is changed to a different product. This can lead to decreased nutrient delivery, unintentional weight loss, a decreased ability to fight infection, and impaired wound healing. It can also overlook the fact that it's not the tube feeding that's causing the diarrhea and that a more likely etiology is being ignored. The most common etiologies of diarrhea include medications or drug-induced diarrhea, infection, underlying gastrointestinal disease, and constipation, specifically in the context of fecal impaction. We're going to take a look at each of these, starting with drug-induced diarrhea. Drug-induced diarrhea usually occurs because of liquid medications, antibiotics, laxatives, or stool softeners. Liquid medications most often lead to diarrhea when they contain sorbitol or other sugar alcohols. This is because sugar alcohols are poorly absorbed in the small intestine. They pass through it mostly undigested and pull water into the digestive tract leading to a loose or liquid stool. The laxative effect of sorbitol appears to be dose-dependent, meaning that the more a person consumes, the more severe the diarrhea will become. It also appears that patients have different levels of tolerance to it, with some developing diarrhea after receiving as little as 5 to 10 grams. Just for reference, a single 500 mg dose of liquid acetaminophen which is the equivalent of one capsule of extra-strength Tylenol, contains over 5 grams of sorbitol. Other liquid medications that can lead to diarrhea include electrolyte solutions like potassium chloride and sodium phosphate. This is due to their very high osmolarity. The osmolarity of these solutions, which is a measure of concentration, can be over 15 times that of the blood and over 5 times higher than any tube feeding formula. 
high osmolarity solutions, cause water to be pulled into the digestive tract in the same manner that sugar alcohols do. Overall, patients who receive enteral nutrition are more likely to receive liquid medications because they are easier to administer than the tablet form that must be crushed and mixed with water. Antibiotics are known to lead to diarrhea by disrupting the normal balance of gut bacteria in both the small and large intestine. Under normal circumstances, some of the carbohydrates we consume are broken down by the gut bacteria in the large intestine. But when those bacteria are destroyed by antibiotics, that function can be impaired. This leads to a situation that is similar to the one that we saw with liquid medications. Water gets pulled into the digestive tract and liquid stool is passed. The loss of beneficial gut bacteria can also lead to the overgrowth of pathogenic bacteria, like Clostridium difficile, which is also known as C. diff. This bacteria produces toxins that attack the cells of the intestinal wall leading to inflammation and diarrhea that can be anywhere from mild to severe. When it comes to the development of antibiotic-associated diarrhea, it doesn't matter if the antibiotics are administered orally, intravenously, or through a feeding tube. Finally, laxatives and stool softeners can cause diarrhea for obvious reasons. Even though they are given to address constipation, their use can quickly swing bowel movements all the way from hard and dry to loose and watery. These medications are frequently needed for patients who receive enteral nutrition because their activity is often limited and we know that body movement assists with bowel movements. They may also take other medications like opioids or iron pills, have a medical condition like Alzheimer's disease, stroke, or spinal cord injury, or be of an advanced age. All of these can slow down their gastrointestinal transit time. Keep in mind that some laxatives and stool softeners can take up to 74 hours to have an effect. So, if a patient stops receiving a laxative on Wednesday and experiences diarrhea on Saturday, it shouldn't be ruled out as the primary cause. Examples of these medications include polyethylene glycol, lactulose, docusate sodium, and senna. The second etiology of diarrhea we are going to explore is infection. We just saw a classic example with C. diff, but this is not the only infection hospitalized patients are susceptible to. Other bacteria, or viruses like norovirus, can spread rapidly through a hospital, rehabilitation center, or nursing home. These outbreaks happen through the fecal-oral route. This begins when a person infected with the bacteria or virus has a bowel movement. Then they either don't wash their hands properly, or the person caring for them doesn't. Those hands touch multiple surfaces, and the bacteria or virus gets passed on from room to room and person to person. This is why it's so important to practice clean technique like hand washing, wearing personal protective equipment, and using sterile tools when performing patient care. Bacteria and viruses can be easily passed on to patients who receive enteral nutrition through improper handling of formula, medications, or feeding tube equipment, and failure to regularly flush the feeding tube with clean water. Older adults, especially those with weakened immune systems and other illnesses, are most likely to become infected and develop severe cases. In addition to C. diff and norovirus, they are susceptible to Staphylococcus aureus, E. coli, and Salmonella, all of which cause diarrhea. The third etiology we are going to explore is gastrointestinal disease. Just because a patient is having diarrhea, it doesn't mean there should be an immediate investigation for an underlying disease state. But if one is part of the patient's medical history, 
or if the patient has risk factors that raise the concern for one, then of course it should be considered as a possible cause. Examples of medical conditions that are associated with diarrhea are Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, diarrhea-predominant irritable bowel syndrome, pancreatitis, and bile acid malabsorption. This is not an exhaustive list, nor will each one be discussed in detail. But if a patient is having diarrhea because of one of these conditions, and the condition is not being treated properly from a medical perspective, changing the tube feeding formula is going to do very little to alleviate their symptoms. It would be like changing the tires on a car that has a broken engine. For instance, with Crohn's disease, Inflammation in the small or large intestine can lead to diarrhea by inhibiting the absorption of water. Or in the case of pancreatitis, failure to produce an adequate amount of digestive enzymes can lead each of the macronutrients sitting in the digestive tract. This causes water to be pulled in from the surrounding tissues. The fourth and final etiology we are going to explore is fecal impaction. This is when dry, hard stool gets stuck in the large intestine, and it's often a manifestation of chronic constipation. Patients who receive enteral nutrition are at risk for this issue for the same reasons they may require laxatives. In many instances, they are elderly, have a low physical activity level, take medications like opioids or iron pills, or have a medical condition like Alzheimer's disease or stroke. Interestingly enough, it has been reported that chronic use of laxatives can contribute to constipation and fecal impaction as well. This is because long-term reliance on them appears to further inhibit the body's natural ability to respond to the need to defecate. As a result, Patients may progressively require a higher dose of the medication to achieve a bowel movement. Here is how diarrhea from fecal impaction occurs. The dry, hard stool gets stuck in the large intestine, but does not obstruct it entirely, leaving a small space for digestive juices and fluids to pass by. Therefore, this problem can be suspected if a patient begins to have diarrhea after going several days without having a bowel movement. If fecal impaction is suspected, abdominal imaging can be obtained for further evaluation. Treatment usually involves the use of laxatives, or it may require manual evacuation by one of the interdisciplinary team members. This is where the clinician will gently reach into the rectum and remove the stool with their hand. Now you have seen the most common etiologies of diarrhea for patients receiving enteral nutrition. These are way more likely to be the cause than the tube feeding formula. For this reason, you should always look for them first before you go ahead and change it. In the next video, we'll dive into the common reasons tube feeding is blamed for diarrhea and what we can do about it. Here is a summary for this lesson. Diarrhea is an abnormally high volume of feces that is loose or liquid. It's often defined by specific parameters like greater than 500 milliliters of stool per day or greater than three bowel movements per day for at least two consecutive days. Diarrhea is problematic because it can lead to dehydration, electrolyte imbalance, acid-base disorders, and pressure injuries. It can also be a source of stress and embarrassment for the patient. Diarrhea can occur whether a patient is eating by mouth, receiving enteral nutrition or parenteral nutrition, or not receiving a nutrition intervention at all. However, there is a unique challenge when a patient who receives enteral nutrition has diarrhea because the tube feeding is often blamed for it. This can lead to decreased nutrient delivery, unintentional weight loss, a decreased ability to fight infection, and impaired wound healing. Better yet, 
It can overlook the fact that it's not the tube feeding that's causing the diarrhea and that a different etiology is more likely and is being ignored. The most common etiologies of diarrhea for patients receiving enteral nutrition include drug-induced diarrhea. This happens from liquid medications, antibiotics, laxatives, and stool softeners. Infection with C. diff, norovirus, and other microorganisms that are transmitted through the fecal-oral route. Gastrointestinal disease, such as Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and pancreatitis, and fecal impaction, where digestive juices and fluids flow around dry, hard stool that is stuck in the large intestine. Whenever a patient who receives enteral nutrition develops diarrhea, these etiologies should be explored before any changes to the feeding regimen are made. Thank you for watching. Check out these videos for more content just like this.